Good afternoon, everyone. Country Flyboy here, and today, IFR flight planning with charts. So we've discussed VFR flight planning. It took forever, and it was a little complicated, but it's the first thing to learn because VFR is where the basics are at. VFR information, if you recall, was really generic stuff, just picking the points on the ground, and the only time you really needed aircraft-specific stuff was when you had to reference the performance info. V IFR is not that simple, however. IFR is greatly dependent on the capabilities of your airplane, specifically with avionics and navigation capabilities. So, for the first example airports, we're going to be um, going from Craig to Tifton again, and we're going to show you how different this would be if it was an IFR flight. So, um, real quick, I'm going to show you a quick example of flight planning from my IFR charts. Uh, let's do Craig to Lake City real quick. And that this would probably be a route for that. Why is Skyvagger still doing this? Hold on. <coughs> All right. So if we were planning Craig to Lake City and we wanted to fly at IFR, you could be forgiven for thinking this was the route that you would file. This is a pretty good one. Direct Cecil, direct Lake City, since they're not even 50 miles apart, really. Well, they're about 60. So they're only 60 miles apart. You could be forgiven for thinking this would be a good IFR flight to pick. Oh, how wrong you would be. This is what you would actually get. So even if you filed Craig, Cecil, Lake City, um, when you requested your IFR clearance, this is most likely what you would get. There could be any number of reasons why they would send you this way. Actually, with these uh, storm cells over here, they'll more than likely send you along Victor 198 to Taylor, then to Lake City. But you could get something like this, even though you filed something completely different. When you file a flight plan, that route that you put in, that's more of along a request with IFR flights. Not an actual bona fide right, you will get this. That's a request. That's the route that you've planned for, and that's the route that you want. But uh, that's very rarely the case. So for IFR flight planning, we're going to need a few things. So just like with VFR, we're going to need the E6B emulator, aviationweather.gov, defense notams. We're going to add two new websites, one of which is going to be FlightAware. You can also use flightplan.com or something similar. But this, we'll get into this in a second. We're also going to need the preferred FAA route database. There's a specific way that you would go about doing this. Um, and as before, we also need a calculator, performance info, notepad, and um, a nav log if you want one. This is an IFR nav log that I made for IFR flying in flight sim. Um, I made it pretty quickly. I haven't tested it out yet, but uh, <clears throat> an IFR nav log would look something like this. A bit different from the VFR nav log, but um, it's mostly the same. <clears throat> I might show you how to fill that out. IFR flying is a little bit different from VFR flying. Okay, so we also need to know the performance of our airplane. Let's say we're flying the A2A-182. That is definitely IFR equipped. It has two VORs. might have a GPS depending on your avi avionics setup. So let's assume we're flying an RNAV capable airplane. So it has GPS and two VOR receivers. It's capable of flying both Victor Airways as well as RNAV routes. <clears throat> So that's going to be our sample airplane for most of this video. So very first step, and we do this pretty similar to VFR, very first step in planning your IFR flight is to draw the straight line between the two. From this point on, you actually don't look at the charts. Well, for a while anyway. First you'd want to go ahead and look up your weather. So real quick. Flight path tool. Oh. So again, go to the standard briefing, and you'd look weather up and all that, see what things are doing. The, the first thing you'd want to do is make sure that your departure airport is good enough to fly, that you can fly, and you're not going to be busting minimums. Next, you'd want to look at NOTAMs. Uh, we don't have a route yet, but I can tell you we're going to be K C R G to KTMA, just like before, show en route airport, and this is vitally important that you show FDC TFR notices. Because remember when we discussed VFR, 
we saw several things that were IFR specific only. Well, since we're flying IFR now, we need to know these things. So we see the standard notums, um, obstruction, lights out of service. We're flying IFR, so we really care even less about these obstructions since we're going to be away from them anyway. We do care about these two. <coughs> we really care about this stuff here, the stuff that we didn't care about in VFR. This is what we want to look at with IFR. So let's see, Jackson Craig, let's see, VOR, ILS, VOR, RNF, RNF. We want to look and see if there's any changes to approaches. Um, things like this are listing changes to the published approach charts that haven't been published yet. So if, if whatever approach charts are p current now, these notums are listing changes to them that are not on the chart. So as you can see here, Jack's executive at Craig, RNAV, GPS runway 14, one amendment, LPV decision altitude is 293, LNAV, VNAV decision altitude is 418. LNAV height above terrain is 459, all categories. Chart touchdown zone is 41. This RNAV GPS running rate 14, amendment 1A, yada yada. It, it's saying that the minimums listed here are different from what's on the chart. <coughs> so this would be something you'd want to make note of, especially during your pre-flight planning, and list it in the notes section of your nav log. So yeah, just like before, check NOTAMs, check weather, see if there's anything affecting your route. En route NOTAMs pay especially attention, special attention to, uh, specifically, if I can find them, the FDC NOTAMs, which is down here. Temporary flight restriction, they're defined radius, zero to the vortex, let's see, gas, ATM, gas, venting, okay. Right, especially the en route FDC TFR notices, because this is telling us where TFRs are and any other things to en route waypoints and stuff like that will be listed here. Uh, right now, there's only one TFR, and it is uh, around near Sarasota, which is out of the way, and it's uh, for gas venting, persuading it to possible wildfire, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so just like before, weather notums, but Instead of going back to plan the route now, what we actually do now is we do something else. We look at a website like FlightAware or FlightPlan.com and look and see if what people are getting is what you want to do. So they've, they've made this one, um, they've, they've been making this a little harder to find, KCRG, KTMA. You'd search FlightAware to see if there's any recently flown routes. The whole reason you do this is not so you can copy paste the route, although that's what you're going to do. It's you're looking to see what people have been getting. So if the route has been flown recently, then a route will show up on FlightAware. And you could file that because most likely that's what you would get. Even if you filed something completely different, they may give you that instead. Now, as you can see here, there's no IFR routes for our chosen airports. Next, we would want to look at um, FAA preferred routes. We're going to skip this for now because I already know this isn't going to apply, and we're going to come back to it later. Okay, so we've looked at FlightAware. There's no routes, no preferred routes. We are now in a situation where we have to plan our own route. <coughs> okay, so how do we plan an IFR flight plan? Well, we start with the de departure airport just like before, and we want to look at its departure procedures. KCRG is our departure airport. We care about the um, plates section. So what we want to look for right now is SIDS. Remember we're working for the departure airport first. We want to pick our first en route waypoint. So first thing we need to look for, SIDS. There are no SIDS for Craig. However, that does not mean we are done. We already know there's ODPs for Craig because we've gone over them before. So that's where we want to check next. Takeoff minimums. Before we check takeoff minimums though, note there are instrument approaches here. So the diverse departure is still on the table right now. Okay, so we load up the takeoff minimums document and we scroll through it until we find Craig, which is in the Jacksonville entries. Jacksonville executive at Craig. So remember, diverse departure is still on the table. Takeoff minimums and obstacle departure procedures, Amendment 4. Takeoff minimums for runway 23, standard with climb of 360 feet per nautical mile, 
1500 or 1300 two and a half for climb and visual conditions. So that says 23 has a, a VCOA departure. Um, we're going to go over VCOA departures uh, when we're done with the charts tutorial. VCOA departures are a type of um, ODP. We'll go over them later but in another video, but for right now, all you need to know is they are basically the reverse of the corkscrew approach. If you know the corkscrew approach that the military likes to fly, where they circle over the field and they come into land, a VCOA is basically the same as that. It's just in reverse. You're climbing instead of descending. Okay, so takeoff minimums for only 2-3 are, are standard with a climb of 360 feet per nautical mile or 1,300 for 2.5 for climbing visual conditions, depending on which one you're doing, if you want to do the VCOA or if you want to just do... So, so that says 2-3, all runways have standard departure minimums for Craig, except for 2-3, which has this one, which are standard with just a steeper climb gradient. Oh, we have some departure procedures. Okay, so we see there are ODPs for this airport. There's one for runway 23, runway 5, and runway 14. That means that we cannot fly diverse unless we take off from runway 32. Runway 32 is the only one we can fly the diverse departure off of. Um, so, yeah. We'd see which run at this point, we'd see which runway is active to see which runway we'd most likely get. Uh, try to predict which one way we'd get on departure so we can we want to read through these prior to departing but um let's just say for the sake of the argument that runway five is active I'm not, we can actually look and see winds are currently one zero zero at eight one zero 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 nine zero one zero zero that would actually mean yeah runway five is active right now that was a lucky guess wasn't it okay where was i right here so yeah, runway five is active, so we definitely want to look. We want to look over all of them, but we'd especially make note of runway five because that's the one we're most likely to get. So again, note it's a standard takeoff minimum apply to this runway. Climb heading 051 to 500, then on course. So we have a certain heading to fly until we get to a certain altitude. That's a pretty simple ODP. Okay, so we've got an ODP for this airport. What now? ODPs don't normally end with waypoints. Usually they're just fly heading until altitude, but uh, sometimes they may have you go to a specific waypoint. In this case, they don't. So, barring the departure procedure, um, if the departure procedure doesn't have you go to a specific waypoint, then you need to pick your own first in route waypoint. There's a rule I like to follow, and that is pick a waypoint, preferably a VOR unless there's a VOR on the field or relatively nearby, and you want the first waypoint to be within 50 miles of your departure airport. That's a general rule of thumb I follow. It's not necessarily a requirement. Um, we don't really know what we can pick right now because we don't know which way we're going. So let's actually skip, at this point, we would skip the first in route waypoint and we'd want to go to the last in route waypoint to get an idea of what we're gonna do. So we'll type in destination airfield and look over its procedures. First thing, since we're picking our last in route waypoint, we want to know if there are any sit stars. We see there are no stars for um, this airport. Okay, so no stars. Do we pick our own in route waypoint? No. Um, we see there are instrument approaches. Let's look at the instrument approaches to see what if there are any feeder routes. Remember, a feeder route is designed to take you from the in route environment to the approach. So, a feeder route can sort of serve as a poor man's star in a way. <coughs> so, the way I like to I like to look at approaches in a specific order, and that is most accurate to least accurate. This airport has an ILS, an RNAV, or two RNAVs and two VORs. So, we'd want to look at the ILS first, then the RNAVs and the VORs. So, let's look at the ILS. And I like FlightAware, shows you a little preview before you download it. We can see immediately there is a feeder route from the Valdosta VOR. Just look real quick at one of the RNAVs. Um, there is a feeder route from the Valdosta VOR on that one. What about 3.3? Uh, nope, no feeder routes for that one. Okay, so we can see the Valdosta is a reoccurring theme, the Valdosta VOR, that it's a feeder route. Okay, so that tells us that... Valdosta would be a good choice as our last in route waypoint. 
since flight since sky vector has been screwing up I'm gonna go add I'm gonna do this okay so we've picked our last in route waypoint to be Valdosta VOR and now you see why I um, I delayed picking the first in route waypoint once I saw we didn't have one chosen for us is it this was going like this so I could have been thinking that Oda over here or Krissa would have been a good first in route waypoint but if we go to Valdosta, then that makes Mona a better one. So now that we've picked our last in route waypoint, we can see the relative direction that we need to go. <clears throat> so now we can have an easier time picking our first in route waypoint. Again, you want it within the first 50 miles, but this also depends on the departure airport and the capabilities of your airplane. If you are VORs only, so slant uniform, slant alpha, something like that, VORs only, you're definitely going to want your first waypoint to be within 50 miles. Most likely a VOR would be your best bet. <clears throat> but keep in mind, you don't have to go direct to waypoints. You can also make use of the radials. Um, you can make your own waypoints. You can do whatever it is you need to do. Um, you just need to know the rules. If you go direct or you pick your own waypoint or something, you need to make note of the off-route obstacle clearance altitude because that's you're going to have to be higher than that. All right, so I can see right away that Mona would be a first in route waypoint, and we could uh, add that pretty simply. There we go. There's Mona. Now, how would we get to Mona from Craig? Well, we are nav capable, so we could go direct to it, or we could use this airway, Victor 198, since it runs from the Craig VOR to Mona. So, yeah, that's what we do. We join the Victor 198 uh, airway after departure. So, 051 to 500 then make a left or right turn to get on course intercept the radial out from Craig which is 290 <clears throat> so now what do we do well now we connect play connect the dots so the whole this is where IFR flight planning can get a lot easier than VFR is that we only have to pick two waypoints and then we play connect the dots and you can see right away pretty simply the route that would be you would need to use again you'd want to check your notums as you go to make sure um, things are usable as well as weather and we can see we have some storm cells popping up down here convective sigmet but anyway let's play connect the dots so victor 198 to mona we can add taylor to the plan it's probably going to screw up nope it did it Okay, so we can add Taylor to the plan. Um, could we go from Taylor direct Valdosta? We could, um, if the uh, ATC could let us through the uh, Moody 2 MOA. We're going to have to go through the Moody 1 MOA. Uh, let's say, um, if we filed this from Taylor direct Valdosta, um, we could get um, a clearance that's different. We could, they could say cleared to Mona, Victor 198 to Hattie, direct Valdosta then is filed, which would be this, meaning that there's probably something going on in the Moody 2 South MOA they don't want us to know about. Let's try to steer clear of the MOA as long as we can. Uh, try to only go through one MOA if we can help it. So I see right away, oh and plus we need to worry about the off-route obstacle clearance altitude. Uh, 3,400 is the highest one for this little bit stretch here, so yeah, 3,400. We could definitely get above that, no problem. We're in a 182. Let's actually continue on Victor 198 to Hattie, where we will join Victor 579. I'm guessing, I'm not sure if it's broken there or if it does continue, but this is what we would file. So for this route, and by the way, we would fill everything out just like we would VFR. So for this route, we are KCRG. KCRG, KTMA, hadn't picked an alternate yet. <clears throat> so right away we've seen our route. We can fill out um, the rest as far as distance and whatnot. We need to pick an alternate. First we'd want to look and see do we need an alternate. Does the weather require an alternate? Weather's good at Tifton today, so no, alternate is not required. Tifton has instrument approaches, so alternate's not required even though the weather's good. So we could actually not file an alternate for this and just go direct. It may behove you to look around and see um, what alternates there are. I often pick an alternate anyway, but do remember that if you file an alternate, you have to carry the fuel for that alternate. 
So if you're stretching the fuel lines, which you better freaking not be, but you could, you don't have to file an alternate for this. Alma would be a good alternate in case you're wondering. <clears throat> so let's just go ahead and do that. So we'd want to look for an alternate. Um, I like alternates that are around 50 nautical miles away. Reason being is you don't want the alternate to be close to the airport. We've stated this before. So we would look at things like alternate minimums and stuff like that. So let's um, look around. <clears throat> Thankfully, Tifton has a VOR. We have any number of directions to go for our alternate. We can head over to Albany. We can head up to um, this VOR, which can get it to Vienna, which can get us to Eastman or even Macon up there. Put it out of the way, but we could do it. Or we could just use Alma, which is close. Let's actually head to Albany, though, since I know Albany has services. So let's make Albany our um, alternate. And that is K-A-B-Y. <clears throat> We're not done yet. We want to look at Al Albany first to see if there are any alternate minimums, um, if it could even be our alternate. Um, we'll go ahead and say for the sake of the argument that it can be. Next, we want to plan the route to the alternate. We're not going to be able to go direct, so... Well, we could. They are close enough, but most cases, they're not going to let you go direct. But we do have the Victor 578 airway to the PCAN VOR, so let's go ahead and add that. PCAN VOR, I know from experience, serves as a feeder route to the approaches into Albany, so this can be our route. So right now, we are done now. We have a total distance of 197 nautical miles. Um, for IFR, it's almost always best to round up for total distances. So let's round that up to 198 nautical miles. 198. <clears throat> How long is it going to take us to fly this? Well, now you'll be doing everything that you did VFR, getting the ground speed and stuff like that. So real thing I need to mention real quick is IFR charts are almost always magnetic oriented. These longitude latitude lines, as usual, are true north oriented. However, VORs, airways, and everything else is magnetic north oriented. So what that means is the courses on these airways are in magnetic course. So for IFR flying, they give you the magnetic course already. Um, you don't need to worry about the true course. And if you look at our IFR nav log, you can see you punch in the magnetic course apply the wind correction angle to get magnetic heading, then apply deviation to get compass heading. So real quick, I'll actually show that to you. Our first magnetic course, let's just say from um, Taylor, we'd use these numbers here, 276. <clears throat> that is the wrong one. 276, and let's say the wind correction angle was minus 3. That's 273. And let's say deviation was plus 1 that's 274. So that's a pretty easy number right there. So yeah, this, this is basically how you go. Just remember, these are in magnetic, so you can actually forget things. And on your E6B, you can then use the um, heading, ground speed, and wind correction angle. You just gotta remember that these are magnetic. We said the winds were like 260 at seven on the last video. Uh, true airspeed 131. We'll just use the same numbers. Magnetic course was 276. Oh shoot! I, I got those backwards. When the speed and 260. There we go. So it's giving us a minus one wind correction angle and a ground speed of 124 knots for that bit right there. <clears throat> so yeah, it's just like with VFR at this point, you would um, calculate how far you have to go and how long it's going to take you to go it to get your total fuel. Then you would add your reserve fuel, which is for IFR flights, is 45 minutes reserve for day, 60 minutes reserve at night. But just like with VFR, just go ahead and make it a 60 minute reserve. Do yourself the favor. Then add alternate fuel if there is one, because if you picked an alternate, you have to carry the fuel for it. And then add climb and taxi fuel and stuff like that to get total fuel required for flight. All right, so we're getting a bit out of our way right now. So this was a good example. Let's look at them. 
a different one. All right, for our second example, we're going to look at Tallahassee to Naples. Um, direct lines about a 288 nautical mile flight following the coast down. Uh, we've got to get through some Bravo and a Charlie, another Charlie, and it's right down there. Okay, so how do we um, do this? Well, just like before, we have to um, plan a flight. So we look at FlightAware. There's no recent routes. Look at preferred FAA routes. There's none there. So we're in a situation we have to plan our own route. What do we do? We look at the Parcher Airport first. There are no SIDs for Tallahassee. So we know there are instrument approaches. So diverse departure is on the table. Let's look at that. Take off minimums. Diverse departure is on the table still. We have to check if there are any ODPs. So we got to find Tallahassee on here. Tallahassee, Tallahassee, Tallahassee. 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 However the hell it's pronounced. There it is. Tallahassee. I just saw it there. Tallahassee. Takeoff minimums. ODPs. Amendment 1. There are none. There are no takeoff. There are no takeoff minimums, meaning that all runways at Tallahassee have standard departure minimums, and there are no obstacle departure procedures. So diverse departure is the name of the game at Tallahassee. We can fly the diverse departure for any runway at Tallahassee. Note the nearby obstacles if you want, but diverse departure. So no first in route waypoint is picked for us. We would need to pick one that's within 50 miles, following my rule again. Let's go down to Naples real quick, which is Alpha Papa Foxtrot. Let's go down to Naples and look. Okay, so there are stars for this airport. I see three stars. We got to look over these stars real quick to see if any apply to us. Just because we're a GA airplane, a 172, doesn't mean that we won't get a star. So how do we look at stars to determine if we get them? Or we just look at the approach plate or the star itself. And two things we got to note. One, its direction. Which way is it going? This one's coming from the St. Petersburg VFR or VOR, which is over um, Tampa to Sarasota, then to Zeller and the airports over here. So we can see this one's going southeast bound, which is the direction we're going. So this one fits our direction. Uh, are there any notes? There's a note right here, chart and SM scale. And another one here, tippy transition not available for turbojet aircraft file pie transition. But we look, there are no notes that say that this is turbojet only. That's one of the things you want to look for. Does it have any specific navigation requirements such as RNAV? And is it turbojet only? If it's either one of those, if, it, if you can't fly the star because of navigation capabilities, say we're not RNAV equipped and it was an RNAV star, or it's for turbojets only, then forget it. Don't even bother reading it. You don't need it anymore. This one is not for turbojets only. We could get this star. So real quick, let's look at the other two. Piker 3. Okay, from Seminole VOR, which is over Tallahassee. So this one could decide our entire route for us if it's usable. Let's see. Radar required, GPS required, RNAV 1, Turbojet, turboprop only. Well, that precludes it. We're a 182. We're not a turbojet or a turboprop. Throw it out the door. We don't need it. Shift 2 comes from Alma. Heads southbound. It's a bit out of our way. So we don't um, even need to look at this one. This is way too far out the way to even care about it. Comes from a completely different direction. So Zeller 3, it is. So we'll go ahead and pull up this one. And we can see um, tippy transition not available for turbojet aircraft. Uh, we're not turbojet, so we could use either tippy or the St. Petersburg transition. St. Petersburg is a bit closer to our route. If you find it, it is this VOR right there, St. Petersburg. Look how close that is to our route versus tippy's way the heck over here somewhere. So. Let's go ahead and file this one. We'll add St. Petersburg to the plan. And that is our last en route waypoint. No need to um, connect any more down here. So we've decided our last en route waypoint. Now we, just like before, we go back up here to see if that helps us determine a first. 
Well, um, it kind of did if you wanted to stick along Victor 97, which takes us a little far offshore. In fact, if we look at the furthest point, we're going to be 30 miles away from the shore. That's a bit too far for my taste. Plus, the in minimum in route altitude right here is 7,000 or 4,000 for RNAV. And we're a bit close to these warning areas. I think we should stick over land a bit more. So, um, this didn't help us, really. It didn't help us determine our first in route waypoint. So, let's pretend that Victor 97 is not there. And the only two options we have are Victor 521 or Victor 7 over here. What do we do? We gotta pick our first in route waypoint. Well, Cross City could be a good one. It's a VOR, but that goes a bit beyond 50 nautical miles. In fact, it's 83. Um, again, the 50 nautical mile thing's not a rule. It's just a practice that I like to follow, especially if you're slant alpha, slant uniform, and you don't have RNAV capability. It's a really good one. But do note that um, you can bend this rule a bit if, say, the, there's a VOR on the airport or a one nearby. In this case, we have the Seminole VOR, which is nearby. So we could take off from Tallahassee, and since we can do the diverse departure on any runway, as long as we get up to 3,400 within 25 nautical miles, which at 200 feet per nautical mile, we certainly will. In fact, 200 feet per nautical mile is uh, 5,000 feet, 25 miles around. That's uh, the gradient. So. If we can get up to 3,400, before we hit 25 miles away from the departure airport, we won't hit anything as long as we maintain the 200 feet per nautical mile climb gradient. Um, so note, we could go to Seminole and then join the airway, or, since, or we could just join the airway. We don't actually have to join an airway at a particular point or a VOR. You can join the airway any, any point. Uh, remember, it is nothing more than a radial from a VOR, for the most part, so that is a thing we can do. Uh, we could also, if we take off on runway 27, we could track the IPLQ localizer outbound to Olga, and that will, or Olgi, and then that gets us on the Victor 7 airway. So we could add Olgi, or we could just file cross city, like that with the intention of joining the Victor 7 airway. We do, don't have to file that. Now, in real life, if you depart here, they're going to give you radar vectors. And if you filed Cross City heading that way, they're most likely going to give you radar vectors to either join a radial direct across City, which is a thing you can do, or they'll get you onto this airway. Most likely, they will vector you onto this airway. So what I would do is actually file Cross City as my first waypoint with the intention of using Victor 7 to get there. And we would join Victor 7 immediately after departure. So how would you punch this into a GPS though? If you, um, let's say you were uh, punching in your GPS, so how would, or FMS, how would you punch this in instead of using Cross City as your first waypoint if you wanted to just join the airway at some port, some part before Cross City? Oh, you would punch this in your FMS like this. You would add the Seminole VOR first, and then Victor 7 across city. No intention of going to Seminole. That just gives you the line that you need to do. So our actual track is probably going to be something like that. So that's what we'll file. Cross City is the first in route waypoint. St. Petersburg is the last in route waypoint. Then we'd file this star. So real quick, let me bring up WordPad. How would we file this? KTLH to Cross City, Victor 35, it looks like. Yep, we could take Victor 35. That does take us over the water, but much closer. That's a hell of a lot better, because that's less than 10 miles at the furthest point versus the 20 miles that it was over here. So we could take that, or we could um, use Victor 7 all the way down to Nitz and then join Victor 441. Let's just use Victor 35, just to make our lives a bit e easier. Note, Victor 7, Victor 35, Victor 97 excludes airspace below 2,000 feet outside the continental 
limits of the United States. Okay. 3,000 feet is the MEA. So we'd file Victor 35 to pi. Then we look back at the star to see how it, they want us to file it. This right here is how they want you to file it. This is the Zeeler 3 star. Um, note everything after the decimal there. So Zeeler dot Zeeler 3 is how you would file it if Zeeler was your first in route waypoint. How would we file this if St. Petersburg is our first in route waypoint? Right down here. So for the St. Petersburg transition in the parentheses here is how they want you to file it if you plan on using it. So PIE dot Z-E-I-L-R-3 Z-E-I-L-R-3 to K-A-P-F so that's how you would file that one so a quick recap just like before first in route waypoint last in route waypoint connect the dots alright got another couple of examples I want to show remember we skipped a bit in the first one so let's show the actual process you would do this um, we've switched up airplanes let's say we're flying a turbojet uh, let's say we're flying a Learjet for a charter company and the flight's going to be from Atlanta Hartsfield to Chicago O'Hara so let's plan this out so again we've drawn the direct line we know the airports next thing we need to do is check flight aware so if we go um, IFR route analyzer K-A-T-L K-O-R-D Well, how about that? There's routes between these two airports. A ton of them, actually. Alright, so here we've seen the most recently used routes by real-life airplanes. It shows the distance, the route, the altitude, as well as how often it gets used. Um, I don't know how far back these go. I think these only show the most recent routes in the past three or four days so for the past let's say five days for the past five days this route here has been used a hundred times so this is definitely one so let's so right now we would actually um we would pick that that's what we'd go with or any one of these routes really but most likely this one since that's getting used the most if we could file that we definitely want to check that over to make sure we could fly that since we are a certain type of airplane but yeah that's what we'd look at flight aware is not a website for you to just copy paste a route even though that's what most people use it for flight aware is useful for seeing what other airplanes are getting to see what you would get if you were flying this route now let's move on let's say for the example that these weren't here, so all these routes go bye-bye. FlightAware didn't help us, there was nothing. Our next step is actually not plan the route ourselves, it's check the FAA preferred routes. So the FAA preferred routes are um, routes that the FAA has published that they want planes to take between two cities. So they sort these by city pair, sorta, if you look at the actual document. A city pair is just a terminal area, basically, so the Atlanta city is ATL, the ATL terminal area. Chicago is ORD. We don't really need to care about that. We just need to punch in the information here. So all we really need is our departure and destination. We could fill out all this other crap, crap here. Route type, area, altitude, string, all that. If you don't punch anything in, this is just um, this is fly.faa.gov, by the way, or just Google search FAA preferred routes is the first link you find. Um, we don't need to fill out any of this because if you don't punch anything in, then it returns all values for that field. And you can also use wildcards, which is nice. Okay, so we've got our departure and destination. Submit search terms. No data given search team terms, so there's no preferred routes. You know why? Because I used the four letter ICAO identifier. That's a mistake that a lot of people make with flight simming. Uh, since most flight sim add ons and even the FMSs want you to use the four letter ICAO identifier 
when you're planning this stuff, you need to use the three letter identifier, A-T-L-O-R-D. There we go, that fixed it. <clears throat> so, we see there are preferred routes between these two airports. All right, so what's a preferred route? It's a route they want you to take. So if you see a preferred route for your airport, and this is your one of your steps before you plan your own, you find which one works for you, then file it. Because it doesn't matter what you file if there's a preferred route. If there's a preferred route, that's what ATC is going to give you regardless of what you file. Okay, so first we want to look at the area. Traffic overflying ZID ARTCC to Chicago. That tells us the area we're going through. Next we want to look at the aircraft. So this tells us what type of planes will get what route. So this route here for non-advanced RNAV only, they get this route. DME, DME, IRU, or GPS equipped will get this route. And if you look back at FlightAware, Cadet 9 to Cadet, Glazer Q1118, or 11.8 to MZZ, VEC1. ATL, Cadet, Glazer, Q118, MZZ, VEC1, ORD. Hmm, pretty similar. Non-advanced nav aircraft only. ATL, J89, IIU, MZZ, OXI, OXI6, ORD. <coughs> so yeah, the FAA preferred routes are telling you what you could get. So if there's a preferred route, use it. Find which one would work for you. In this case, since we, we said we're a Learjet, um, we, it would be one of these two. Let's just say we're a Learjet that's on par with navigation equipment. So it's RNAV capable, advanced RNAV. This would be the route we'd file. And that's the route we would get. Takes us from ZTL to ZAU. Uh, if we were lower altitude, say a Cessna or something like that, we're sticking to the Victor Airways, this is the route we would get because it is from 6,000 to 17,000. And you can see it sticks to the Victors. So, yep. <coughs> That's how it's done. You look at FlightAware, barring FlightAware, look at preferred routes. The reason I say look at FlightAware first is because... If there is a preferred route, that means it's a route that's flown pretty frequently and it will show up here most likely. So for one last time, let's look at planning a flight if we were a jet. And I know for a fact there are no preferred routes from Daytona Beach, although there are flight aware routes for Daytona Beach. So let's say if we were if Let's say that FlightAware, we're flying from Atlanta to Daytona Beach, let's say FlightAware gave us nothing and um, there were no FAA preferred routes. So we now have to plan our own route and we're in a turbojet. That's fun, fun, fun. Okay, so it, take it just like it is. It's just like before. This is Flying is really a lot of information that stacks up. Everything's the same but different. It all stacks up. That's why you start at the bottom and work your way up. So I know for a fact that one of the SIDs out of Atlanta ends at Punnett and has a Macon transition. Let's add Macon as our first en route waypoint. Punnett 8 would be the SID we're using, Macon transition. And I know there are no stars into Daytona Beach. I'm, I'm using local knowledge to save time. I know for a fact that there's no stars in the Daytona Beach. I also know that there are no good feeder routes unless you're RNAV equipped. So let's say we wanted to stick to the airways. We would have to make Ormond Beach our last en route waypoint, and that's pretty close to Daytona Beach because that's the only feeder route into Daytona Beach for the direction we're going. <coughs> so yeah. So now we got our first en route waypoint and our last en route waypoint, and just like before, we connect the dots. We just have to remember that we are in a turbojet airplane, so we need to use the high en route charts since we're going to be going up high. And we need to remember that our navigation capabilities, we are RNAV with VORs. Advanced RNAV too, most likely has VNAV capability as well. So just like before, we would just play connect the dots. Let's um, add the Alma VOR and the Craig VOR. Oh, what do you know, it frilled up again. I don't know why it keeps doing that. 
Well, there's a good route. So from Macon, J45 goes all the way down to Craig. Uh, actually, Ormond Beach. So we'd file Macon, J45, Ormond Beach. Done. No stars and no good feeder routes. Uh, we would most likely be getting vectored for the approach prior to Ormond Beach, but this is what we'd file. And it's just like before. It's just like you did with the Cessna. You play connect the dots, pick an alternate if you need to, make sure you can meet the alternate minimums, which uh, we've gone over before, and uh, or the alternate's alternate minimums. <laughs> anyway, so it's really the same as IFR. Once you pick the route, once you pick the departure, destination, and the route, you can pick an alternate, add everything together to get total time and total fuel needed, and you're good to go. File the flight plan. And you know, figuring this stuff out, we went over in the VFR, and that's why I stress, I know a lot of IFR flyers and flight sim, everyone likes to go IFR out of LA to Atlanta somewhere. That's Everyone likes to do that. Very first thing they do when they get their flight sim, they fire up a 747 and they wanna go IFR from LA to Atlanta, but you, you really miss out because I can tell you from experience a lot of flight simmers think they know what they're doing, but they really don't. Uh, because they rely on the FMS too much, they rely on that pretty magenta line. There's absolutely no reason why you can't fly current procedures on a website like VATSIM or IVEO, even if your nav date is out of date, because these charts are publicly available. They're free of charge. You can get them from Sky Vector or any other website that has them. So there's no reason why you shouldn't. You need to learn VFR first because that's where you learn to walk. A lot of VFR is learning the math behind these things. IFR, when you start learning IFR, they expect you to know how to get a wind correction angle and apply compass deviation and all that. So that's not covered in IFR training because you better know how to do that already. So yeah, learn VFR stuff first because that's the building block. If all else fails, you have that. And VFR flying is never going to fail you because, well, the planet Earth's not going anywhere. At least we hope not. Not anytime soon, anyway. <laughs> so yeah, learn VFR first, then worry about IFR. And don't be afraid of SIDS and STARS. A lot of people are scared half to death of SIDS and STARS um, for some reason. SIDS and STARS really aren't that hard for the most part. ODPs are scarier and most people aren't scared of them but that's only because they don't really know much about them or even that they exist. So yep, that is my video on planning IFR flight plans. Quick recap, departure airport, destination airport, weather notams, route. You can get it from FlightAware or flightplan.com. If you don't find it there, check FAA preferred routes. If you don't find it there, then you have to plan your own. If you have to plan your own, look at SIDS or ODPs. If there are none, fly the diverse departure. If there is no diverse departure, well, that means you're flying in an airport that is not IFR certified, which means you cannot safely fly out of that airport. Case in point, if we look at World VFR real quick, <coughs> if we wanted to fly IFR out of Davis Field, and I'm just going to add Lake City because the hell of it. Let's say we wanted to fly IFR from Davis Field to um, Lake City. If we check Davis Field, identify our 3 Juliet 6. Oh, there are no our IFR plates for this. This means there is no departure procedure, so no SID or ODP for 3 Juliet 6. And the lack of instrument approaches means there's no diverse departure for 3 Juliet 6. So, you could not safely depart IFR from 3 Juliet 6. How would you depart if you, now could you fly IFR out of here? Legally, yes. Safely, no. Because again, since there's no published procedures, there's no way to know for sure that you can keep clear of any obstacles if you're actually in IMC conditions. The way you would do this is you'd depart this airport VFR and pick up IFR in the air. Or if you tried to depart IFR on the ground, they would just tell you departure at own risk. Meaning it's not their responsibility if you hit a tower. <laughs> so yeah, you can fly to airports that aren't technically IFR. So yeah, that's the procedure and that's the video. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.